Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, does the Northern Territory need a second intervention? Why has Barack Obama chosen now to release his birth certificate? And why Kevin Rudd thinks the BBC should lighten up over the royal wedding coverage. Our panel tonight, host of First Tuesday Book Club, Jennifer Byrne, political author Phil Senior and New South Wales Greens MP Kate Fairman. While the Prime Minister tours Asia and Europe, opposition leader Tony Abbott has been visiting Aboriginal town camps in Alice Springs. He's in the Northern Territory at the invitation of traditional owners. And Mr Abbott has taken the opportunity to call for a second intervention. Very important um, that government respond appropriately, and that doesn't mean business as usual, but, uh, but it should be uh, a response which government directs and decides, uh, but which is done as far as is humanly possible uh, in partnership and in consultation. Now, I'm not saying we've got to wait for consensus, because consensus is rarely reached before uh, a policy decision is made. Indigenous Affairs Minister Jenny Macklin has also backed a further intervention to include a stronger focus on education. So do Indigenous communities in the Territory need another intervention? Kate, what do you think? Well, clearly the intervention isn't working. The, the government monitors how the intervention is going with a report called Closing the Gap. Um, that's found that, in fact, instances of abuse, instances of sexual assault, um, self-harm have actually increased since the intervention has taken place. What's needed isn't another paternalistic approach, which is what the intervention is. The community needs to be empowered around this. The community needs to be making decisions about the solutions. Um, the intervention is a very, very controversial topic. As my uh, colleague in the Senate, Rachel Seawitt, has said, it is regarded as, um, by Territorians as, you know, Essentially, it doesn't work and it's trouble and um, it's very controversial. But some people in the communities do support it, especially welfare quarantining, because they think that it helps get uh, young kids food on the table. Some people do support it, but the fact is that the community doesn't feel like it owns it. This has been imposed by the federal government. Clearly, again, they were wanting some kind of a good outcome after four years. So to say that we're going to have a second intervention after four years, when in fact a lot of the problems that they were supposed to have fixed seem to have increased you know, really indicates that it isn't the solution. Phil, the reason why we're talking about a second intervention is because the, the first intervention is due to expire in August next year. Do you think there should be a second one? I, I do, but I can if I could just take issue with, with what Kate said there about the statistics bearing out that the intervention hasn't actually worked. I think you need to be very careful with making that claim based on the data because what it suggests is that incidents of sexual abuse and so on reported and incidents of violence reported have increased. Well, that's not surprising given that one of the key things the intervention uh, to put in place was a significant law enforcement presence that simply didn't exist. So that all that's essentially happened is a problem that existed but was off the books has come onto the books. Um, in terms of wh whether we should have a second one, to me it depends what that actually means. If that means we want to see a level of commitment of federal resources, the likes of which didn't exist before 2007, then yes. But if it just means doing the same thing, no. Because I think, as Tony Abbott himself has acknowledged, there were problems with the way this was done originally and an intervention mark too needs to be different in some important respects. Kate, okay, if I can just come get you to come back to Phil's point there, that where he said more police on the beat, then maybe there's more reporting going on and maybe there's been a, a, a culture created of reporting abuse. Yeah, sure. I think there's a bit of, bit of both, actually. But coming back to um, Tony Abbott, it's interesting, Tony Abbott, when he was Health Minister in 2005, had an opportunity to actually do something here well, um, in relation to um, unsniffable petrol or opal. I think he's made an announcement or the Coalition has come out today and said they will su support mandatory rollout across all of Central Australia. Now, when he was Health Minister, he came up with excuse after excuse not to do that. And he had he the perfect opportunity... He did eventually roll it out, but it, did, it was delayed, even though people were asking but for it. But it wasn't rolled out in terms of uh, a complete ban in Central Australia at all, and that's what he's come out and supported today. Jen, what do you think? Do you think there should be a, a second intervention? Look, uh, we're talking about a second as, as a continuation of the first. Point one, what Tony Abbott's talking about, what you're talking about, Kate, which is cooperation, that was precisely what the first intervention was not about. That's right. I mean, John Howard made it quite clear and said, I'm sorry to the Northern Territory, but I'm going to do it. We are not going to be cooperative. So, Even though the first the report, the Little Ch Children of Sacred report, said you, you have to have consultation, they ignored yeah, that part of the report. Because, because they were riding, and understandably, I'm not kind of actually being critical in hindsight, they were riding an emotional wave, which was the way...
wave of shock that came because of the sexual assault reports. And we were all in shock and they took this dramatic step and they deliberately said we are not going to consult. I find it really strange, now we're talking about a second intervention, when we can't even agree on the results of the first intervention. Mm. Um, you know, yes, you say that, that, that uh, absolutely assault uh, reports have gone up, sexual reports have gone up, but you know, more kids are meant to be in school, according to Jenny Macklin. Other reports have improved, hospitalisation has um, diminished. So, you know, if we can sort of fiddle around the statistics. The fundamental thing is it isn't clear whether that one was successful and I just think it's premature to be talking about a second one. And Phil. surely we can get those types of results with the support and buy-in of the majority of the community. Well, you know, the, can, I think we? That's the, yeah. can we? I, I think that's the issue. If not an intervention mark two, then what do, we, what, what do we go for? Because do we go back to what we did for 25 years, which was a demonstrable disaster? And I think that's the question that people who are opposing intervention mark two need to explain. When we say consultation, making sure we uh, have everyone from the leadership on side and that the community's brought in, that all sounds good, and I'm broadly supportive of that too. But does that in reality just mean a return to the approach pre-2007? Because that simply didn't work. And, and, and Phil, when you have consultation, there's not going to be consensus within those communities, is there? Because some people are in favour of welfare quarantining and some people think it's completely inappropriate. That's right. And my, my personal perspective, you know, yes, it could have been done better in terms of some of the consultation. I, I do agree with that. But the idea of uh, welfare quarantining, the idea of linking welfare payments to children's attendance in school, the idea, although it didn't actually uh, prove to be as effective as it had been hoped, of limiting the spread of alcohol, all of those things seem to have merit. Sure, we could potentially see those policies play out better, but I don't think people would dispute necessarily the merit of all of those. And, I mean, we're sitting here in a studio and we're talking about a report that was done some time ago and it can be read various ways. Mm. The fact is, Chris Norman's up there. He's just did a report, what, on, I think, Tuesday night? Was it on yeah, second? It, yeah. it was basically some people say this, some people right. say yeah. that. I'm not being critical divided. of yeah. Chris at all. It is almost impossible, mm. even on the ground, yeah. to get We're talking unanimity. About 70, 73 so, how communities. are we going to get mm. this cooperation? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be despairing, but it's extremely difficult. Kate, how does this look for the Prime Minister? Tony Abbott invited Julia Gillard to visit Alice Springs Town Camps with her. At the moment, she's going to a royal wedding. Uh, it looks like Tony Abbott's trying to solve a problem. It looks like you know the Prime Minister somewhere else. Is that a bad look for the Prime Minister? Yeah, again, it looks like Tony Abbott's trying to solve a problem, but when he was in position to do so, he didn't as Health Minister. Um, I don't think it looks great that um, the Prime Minister is actually attending the Royal Wedding, regardless of whether Tony Abbott has invited her to, to go into a Central Australia and visit communities. I don't think it looks great at all. Um, she wouldn't have gone with Tony Abbott, of course, but I think the, the real issue here is that um, she's at the Royal Wedding... Uh, <laughs> Why do you have a, a, a problem with that, Kate? It, it, I just think it's, you know, given she's about to deliver a budget, uh, there's a lot going on, there, it is, I find it bizarre that um, someone like Julia Gillard, who is a Republican, is attending the Royal Wedding along with a cast of thousands. It clearly is just for a feel-good, happy snap, bit of a rise in the polls, potentially a Woman's Weekly photo shoot. And Phil, look, I, there's, there's, a lot of other, there's a lot of other prime, there's a lot of other prime <laughs> ministers, right. like the Canadian prime minister, the Indian prime minister, the South African president. They're not going. That's right. And, and you know, for, as a counterpoint, I guess um, New Zealand prime minister John Key is going. But on the other hand, he's also making it's essentially a bilateral uh, talks trip. He's meeting with David Cameron. They're discussing a whole yeah, range so of issues. She. No, no, she's, 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 she's not. She's not. She's not meeting with David no, she's Cameron. Popping she's in, essentially popping in, in um, as a guest and, and then leaving. Nothing. Nothing much is coming from it. But uh, I actually don't think that's a terribly bad look. I have to say, being at the royal wedding, I think. What's a bad look, going back to your original point about uh, the visit to the Northern Territory with Tony Abbott, is not that she couldn't go because she's at the Royal Wedding. It's that she ruled it out the moment he floated the idea. It has nothing to do with the scheduling. She'd already ruled out the idea of going with Tony Abbott, and that I don't understand. I can't understand why there couldn't be an attempt to get some sort of bipartisanship on this issue. Jen, what do you think about that? Should, got... should the Prime Minister have gone with Tony Abbott at another time and, and reorganised the diary? Look, Squeeze Tony, in the wedding and Tony the, and the visit? Abbott would have found another reason to poke... I mean, all he's doing, really... I mean, he has gone, and good on him, at the invitation of the communities. He's just playing a bit of politics and he's pointing at her and saying, and of course... She could have been here, but it's just playing politics because it is a very... De it's not divisive, it makes it more important than it is, but it's a... But he is one of the politicians who's visited remote Indigenous communities more than others. He, he spent a bit of time up in um, Cape York as well. Yeah, but he wasn't invited to the wedding. 
<laughs> is that, do you think he, that's where he really wants to be? I don't know with that. I don't know where he wants to be. But all I know, it, it would be very difficult because she's not there because she wants to be there. I mean, yes, she accepted the invitation. It's a bit rough, you know. The Canadian Prime Minister is about to face an election campaign, you know, and she's not delivering the budget. Actually, it's the Treasurer. So there are reasons why she might be there, which is that a lot of Australians, mistakenly, in my view, <laughs> but nonetheless think it's important, it's a matter of respect, and Tony Abbott would be playing politics with the fact that if she refused to go because she was cocking a snooze yes. at well, royalty. So, you know... Well, on that issue of our respect of the monarchy, the 11th hour cancellation of the Chase's live royal wedding show has sparked outrage on social networking sites, with many Australians disappointed at broadcasting restrictions imposed by Clarence House. Opposition leader Tony Abbott said the event wasn't an appropriate subject for what he termed scatological humour. <laughs> but the Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd said the BBC should lighten up and give a feed of the wedding to the chaser. Chas Lichardello from The Chaser says the coverage was never meant to be hurtful or offensive. <laughs> Not only poor taste, but it just, it just alienate our audience if we just went and just were nasty for four hours. And you know what? We've been there before. We know what that's like and we don't want to do it again. Essentially what we were doing was we were making fun of the media circus, the whole system. It's a ridiculous system, the, the regal system. Uh, we're making fun of almost everyone except for William and Kate themselves because they seem like kind of nice, boring, normal people. <laughs> Speaking of boring, um, is Chaz getting boring if he says he didn't mean to offend Jen? What's oh, going on there? He, I think he's just fibbing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got to say, if a royal wedding isn't a cause for scatological humour of any kind of humour, what is? What is? Kate, the Greens have uh, copped their fair bit from the chaser over the years. So do you think the royal family's game as well? Fair yeah, game? Yeah, of course. I mean, I... Whenever, I think the chaser actually will screen something on the Royal Wedding at some stage. I feel like whatever, whenever they screen the next episode or whatever, it's going to be a biggie um, and it will be absolute gold for them. Unfortunately.